Mr. Quagliotto here, and welcome back. Earlier in previous lessons, we learned about the side-side-side congruence postulate, which basically said if we have three congruent sides to triangles, then the triangles were congruent. Now, we've already discussed that in order to have congruent triangles, you have to have six parts. All of the sides and all of the angles must be congruent. But in this lesson, you're going to learn a bunch of different ways where we only need three given pieces of information to decide that the triangles are congruent. So the first one we're going to look at is the side angle side congruence postulate. And we denote that by SAS. I'm not going to write these out every time. I don't expect you to either. Uh, so get familiar with the different abbreviations. This one just says that if you have two sides of a triangle with an angle between, we call this the included angle. So in other words, we have a side an angle, and a side congruent to a side, an angle, and a side in the same order, then you can say that these two triangles are congruent. So in this example, we have the side RS is congruent to the side UV side. Angle R is congruent to angle U, there's your angle, and side RT is congruent to side UW, there's our side. So by side angle side, we can say that these triangles are congruent. Triangle RST is congruent to triangle UVW. You have to ask yourself if a diagram presented to you in a problem has enough information to actually use one of these congruence theorems or postulates. So in this first example, we notice that we have side AC which every side is congruent to itself, and that is a shared sign, so those sides are congruent. We also have AD congruent to BC. And then our, con our angles given on both of these, you'll notice that they're not between these two sides. So in this situation, there's actually not enough information to prove congruency. But in the second situation, we've got congruent sides, Again, same congruent sides, but the angles here are in between the congruent sides. So we do have enough information. In this second one, we can use side, angle, side to prove this. The next postulate is called the angle, side, angle, congruence postulate. And just as it says, abbreviated ASA, that implies that we need an angle, an in-between included side, and then a following angle. So looking at the examples below, we have angle A is congruent to angle D. Side AC is congruent to DF. And then angle C is congruent to angle F. So we have in both of these triangles an angle, a side, and an angle. It follows ASA. And we can say that these triangles are congruent. At this point, you're probably getting a hang of how to decide if these are congruent using these different theorems. The angle-angle-side congruence theorem, you guessed it, means that you need two angles and a side. And it has to be in the order of an angle, an angle, then a side. So in both of these triangles, we have congruent angles, A and D, congruent angles, C and F, and then congruent sides, C, B, and F, E. Because of that angle-angle-side relationship, we can say that these are congruent by the angle-angle-sides congruence theorem. It's as easy as that. Think back to what you've already learned about right triangles. In a right triangle, we have two different things. We have the hypotenuse, which is just the longest side of the right triangle. So in this case, it's these ones right here. EF and BC are both hypotenuse. And then we have the legs of a right triangle. And the legs of the right triangle are just the two sides that are between that right angle, or the two smallest or shortest sides. Basically, the hypotenuse leg congruence theorem says that as long as we have a congruent hypotenuse, so in this case we have BC, side BC, is congruent to EF. And we also have that the leg, one leg at least, is congruent. So here we have leg AB is congruent to DE. Then we can say that these two triangles are congruent. 
When we refer to this theorem, we're going to usually denote it by HL, just a shorthand, instead of writing out hypotenuse leg every time. You must be able to determine which of these five given congruence postulates or theorems that we have to actually use to prove congruency. In this first question, or first picture here, you'll notice that we have three congruent sides. So that one's easy. Well, three congruent sides, side, side, side is your go-to. In the second picture, we've got a congruent side, an angle, and then congruent sides outside. So just as it reads off in order, you have the angle in between, and we have side, angle, side. This third example, we've got an angle, congruent sides, and another angle. So again, A, S, A, it's pretty easy. But this last one, they're not always going to be as obvious as you'd like them to be. So we might have to use some things that we've learned in the past to decide which of these angles are congruent or which of these sides may be congruent. The first thing I notice is that in the center here, we have a vertical pair or vertical angles, rather. Uh, we have two lines that are intersecting, so the opposite angles are vertical, and we know that they are congruent. Additionally, I notice that we have two parallel lines. If anything's ever indicated as parallel, that should kind of be a flag saying, hey, maybe we can use that to use maybe the alternate exterior angles theorem, alternate interior angles theorem, etc. So what I notice is that we have an angle here, and an angle here that are interior to these parallel lines. So I'm looking at two alternate interior angles, and we know that alternate interior angles are congruent. So we can say that these two angles are congruent. Now what we've just found out is that we have an angle, a side, and an angle. So again, we can use angle, side, angle to prove the congruency of these two triangles. In these next two examples, I'm going to walk you through a formal proof on trying to prove that these two triangles are indeed congruent with some given information and my thought process behind this so that hopefully you can mimic this thought process and try it on your own. The first thing is to indicate the givens on my picture so I can visualize what's going on. We have that AB is congruent to CD, so I'm going to put a dash mark there to let myself know. We also have that AB is parallel to CD, and we use those little arrows to indicate parallel. Now, by doing that, what I'm thinking ahead of time is, okay, well, we have two parallel lines here and here, and we also have a transversal, which is AC. So I've highlighted the transversal in yellow, and I'm thinking that when we approach this problem, by alternate interior angles, I can say that this angle here and this angle here are congruent, as well as these two angles are congruent by alternate interior angles. They're interior to the parallel lines and on opposite sides of the transversal. So already in my picture, I have an angle, a side, and an angle an angle, a side, and an angle. So I can use ASA. That's my end goal. Somehow I want to use ASA, angle side, angle theorem. But I have to formalize that in a proof. So in the first step I can say state the givens. Step one, AB is congruent to CD and AB is parallel to CD by given. Step two, I can state what I can conclude from this. And notice in our picture we kind of made the conclusion that certain angles were congruent by the alternate interior angles are congruent there. So what we have here is that angle DAC angle DAC is congruent to angle ACB. And that represents the thicker uh, angles that I've shown on the diagram. We also have the other two angles that are congruent, angle BAC congruent to angle DCA. And those are the double tick marks. And as we already said, this was by the alternate interior angles 
So I'm just going to write alternate interior. Step three may seem a little bit strange. And the reason being is that, well, it kind of makes sense that segment AC, that side, is congruent to itself. But we do have to write that down. AC is congruent to AC. Because both of these triangles share that same side, and in order to use ASA, you must have that congruent side. And this is just by the reflexive property. Yeah, it seems silly, uh, but it's one thing to remember that you just have to keep putting down each time. And then lastly, since we have an angle aside and an angle in both of them, we can say that these two triangles are indeed congruent. Triangle ABC is congruent to triangle CDA, and that is finally by ASA. Don't bother writing the whole thing down. The abbreviation is completely fine with me. In this last example, we're given a picture of two triangles that are outlined by a couple of perpendicular lines. So as this says, we have AB, so this line here, is perpendicular to line AC. Now what that tells us is this would be a right angle, and we do have to justify that later, but we're just going to let ourselves know that in the picture for now. DE is also perpendicular to AD. So again, that tells us that we have a right angle here. So both of these triangles are right angle. That's one step, or right triangles rather, that's one step towards our goal of having congruent triangles as given here, what we're trying to prove. C is indicated as the midpoint of BE, this entire diagonal line segment. Now from prior knowledge, if C is the midpoint, that means it cuts it directly in two equal pieces. So what we can say is that BC and CE are congruent. That's stuff that we know, but we do have to justify later on. So from here, let's see, we have an angle and we have congruent hypotenuse. Now, one thing you may be thinking right now is, okay, well, we have a hypotenuse, so let's just go straight to the hypotenuse leg. But what we don't have is a leg. We would need to have that this leg is congruent to this leg, or that these two vertical legs, AB, was congruent to ED. And so what you're trying to think of right now is, well, how can I prove that these are congruence? What do I have here given? Well, one thing that I actually do notice is that these two lines intersect, forming two of the angles of the triangles. So these two angles would then be a vertical pair, which means they're congruent by the definition of a vertical pair. So now, rather than the hypotenuse leg theorem, I actually can use that I have an angle, an angle, and a side. So I can use the angle, angle, side theorem. That's going to be my end goal to prove this. Now let's formalize it in a proof. Step one, write your given. After writing the given, I'm really just backtracking and writing down what I just discussed with you in the proof. The first thing I did was look at the fact that we had perpendicular lines and decided that angle A and angle D were right angles. So what I should write down in step two is that angle A and angle D are 90 degrees, or right angles. You could write either of those. And the reason being was the definition of perpendicular lines. In step three, we found that these two line segments, the hypotenuse of these triangles, were congruent. So I'm going to write that down. Line segment BC, or side BC, is congruent to side CE by the definition of a midpoint. And the last piece of information we came up with was that the two angles of these vertical angles were congruent. So we just have to write those angles down. We can write angle ACB is congruent to DCE. Finally, now that we've justified our angle, angle, and side and all of their congruencies, we can 
sum this up by step five, what we wanted to prove, that triangle ABD is indeed congruent to triangle DEC. And we justified that using angle-angle side. And that's the end of the proof. So things to remember when you're proving these is that you're keeping the vertices lined up. So for example, when I was talking about congruency of triangles or even the angles, I lined up ACB with their congruent DCE, their congruent counterparts. And that's important. Now we're going to try some of these on your own in class tomorrow. So make sure if you need to go back and rewind any of this and write it down that you are going back, rewinding, and writing it down and actually gaining something from this lesson.